Since it's nearing the Halloween season, we're going to continue with our gothic, creepy stories with William Faulkner's fantastic horror story, A Rose for Emily. If you haven't heard of or read this classic 1930s Southern Gothic piece, then maybe you're familiar with the zombies retelling of it in their 1968 story, A Rose for Emily. Maybe play it softly in the background while you read the story. Hey guys, I am Dr. Whitney Costers, Professor of English, and if you subscribe to my channel, and if you don't, then please do so now, then you've probably figured out that I have this attraction to macabre, weird, or gothic stories like The Cast of Amontillado, The Lottery, and The Yellow Wallpaper. And I am about to post a lecture on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as well, so be on the lookout for that. Now, today's story, A Rose for Emily, is one of my favorite short stories, and not just because it's creepy, but also because of the way Faulkner so deftly manipulates time and the manner in which Emily is presented and understood, or really misunderstood by the reader. So those are some points that I want to investigate in my lecture today. Now, the story is set during the Reconstruction era, the time after the Civil War when the South had to rebuild and abandon old traditions, customs, and beliefs in order to reinvent themselves into the New South. The aristocracy, like the Grierson's, who had built their wealth on slave labor, were now in a sort of identity crisis, upholding their self-importance and reputation, but facing financial and personal ruin in a desperate attempt to hold on to former customs and resist change. And we see this resistance in Emily, a symbol of the Old South. For instance, in 1894, the mayor, Colonel Sartorus, remits her taxes basically on account that the Grierson's are above such civic duty. But when the next generation with its more modern ideas become mayors, they dismiss the privilege and demand that Emily pay her taxes, which she staunchly refuses, telling the men to talk to Colonel Sartorus, who, as we are told, has been dead for almost 10 years. And when her father dies, we're told that she denies it and that it takes three days of ministers calling on her and doctors trying to persuade her to let them dispose of the body. And most importantly, if you've read the story, then you know that Emily most certainly cannot accept a permanent separation from her lover, Homer Barron. There's this notion then that if one resists change, death is all that one is left with, an implied criticism of the Old South. Now, as a reader of this story, I think it's extremely easy to get caught up in the curiosity and the horror of what Emily is and what she's done. But I think it's important to take a step back and consider who is telling us this, how he's telling it, and why. If you look at the way he's speaking of Emily, it's not as a human who deserves the dignity, privacy, and respect that we all deserve, but as a fallen monument, a tradition, a duty, a care, and a sort of hereditary obligation upon the town. And there are many references to her as an idol and as some sort of deity in the sense that she defies all laws, institutions, and relationships. The community reveres and protects her one minute and then belittles and pities her the next. By objectifying her and her circumstances, the community, in their minds anyway, permits themselves the right to invade and violate Miss Emily without consequence or remorse. And there are several intrusive acts that occur in this five-part story, some of them pretty violent. The community, in effect, forces themselves upon her, coming into her home unwelcome, demanding that she pay her taxes, or telling her that she's disgracing the town by dating Homer. Further, they write to Miss Emily's cousins from Alabama, requesting that even they help further interfere with her situation when Emily does not take well to their pleas. And when four men cross her lawn after midnight and slink about her house like burglars, breaking open her cellar door and sprinkling lime to cover up some sort of odor, we see how violent and intrusive the community is in her life. Even after her death, the town will still not let her alone, as the women attend the funeral primarily because they're curious to see the inside of her home, and the men violently break down the door that's been locked upstairs for the last 40 years. When the story begins, we're told of Miss Emily's house. It is a big, squarish frame house that had once been white, decorated with cupolas and spires and scrolled balconies in the heavily lightsome style of the 70s, set on what had been once our most select street. But garages and cotton gins had encroached and obliterated even the august names of that neighborhood. 
Only Miss Emily's house was left, lifting its stubborn and coquettish decay above the cotton wagons and the gasoline pumps, an eyesore among eyesores. The description of the house is a description of Miss Emily. Both are old, decrepit, and stubborn. It's this old South home amongst the new sidewalks and mailboxes. And when people complain about the smell emanating from the house, the judge speaks of the house as a woman. He says, will you accuse a lady to her face of smelling? And both Miss Emily and the house are respectively assaulted with the various communal intrusions. Miss Emily may be the subject of the story, but we shouldn't discount how important the narrator is. Now, the narrator is one person, but he speaks for the community and their perspective, sometimes referring to them as a few of the ladies, the men, the older people, or the younger generation. He tells us that this now dead woman was perverse and crazy, but sort of leaves it at that for quite some time other than informing us that insanity runs in the Grierson family. Instead of directly connecting the events that contributed to Emily's insanity, the narrator gives us information, but in a controlled, repertorial, emotionalist manner. And he does so in the context of how events in Emily's life impacted them and not her. He says, people in our town, remembering how old lady Wyatt, her great aunt, had gone completely crazy at last, believed that the Griersons held themselves a little too high for what they really were. None of the young men were quite good enough for Miss Emily and such. We had long thought of them as a tableau, Miss Emily a slender figure in white in the background, her father a spraddled silhouette in the foreground, his back to her and clutching a horsewhip, the two of them framed by the back-flung front door. So we are not asked to read this information in the context of how traumatizing this would have been for Emily. We are asked to read Miss Emily and her father as a vignette meant to be publicly viewed and interpreted. But if you think about it more closely, this image of her father standing in front of her with a whip symbolizes that Emily was a victim of the patriarchal standards that allowed men to control the direction of women's lives. And by turning away all potential suitors, her father isolated Emily from the world, and she remains as such throughout the story and in her life. And this may be why she insists on that, you know, that people speak to Colonel Sartorus regarding her taxes, even though he's been dead for almost 10 years. She really may not know he's dead. The woman has been so isolated for so long that I think this seems plausible. And it also seems to be why she killed Homer, a man she clearly believed was going to marry her. The idea of being abandoned once again is probably unbearable. Remember her father, upon whom she was totally dependent, had only recently died, which may also explain why she denies his death for three days, and it's a struggle for the town to retrieve his body for burial. Now, is she crazy? Absolutely. But we owe it to her to understand the source of her mental illness. As I said, Emily remains isolated, but I don't think she does it because she's a misanthrope. After all, she forms a relationship with Homer, and I think she does this because he's an outsider, someone not part of the community. I mean, this is the thing. Would you want to reach out to any of these townspeople? They are aggressive lawyers who judge and condemn her. They are a community that sees her misfortune as a source of entertainment, and they even approve of what they presume to be her impending suicide. If you think about it, this woman has no privacy except by isolation. She is constantly needing to defend herself and her home from literal and symbolic intrusions. Faulkner himself says that he pitied Emily and that the title arose for Emily was a salute to a woman who had had a tragedy, an irrevocable tragedy, and nothing could be done about it, and I pitied her, and this was a salute to a woman you would hand a rose. So what then is the tragedy? Tell me in the comment section below what you think it is. Is it that the town is so nosy and makes sensational and pitiful assumptions about her? That she has no privacy? That they harass her to pay her taxes, interfere by sending the minister and relatives and break into her home to sprinkle the lime? Is it that they see her as a curiosity, a tableau, a fallen monument, an idol? That she is never given the decency of being treated like a human? Remember, the narrator says that it's only when she became a pauper that she had become humanized in their eyes, which 
further demonstrates that everything the narrator tells us about Emily is always in relation to their feelings and needs. Is the tragedy as it's suggested that Homer is a homosexual man, so despite having finally met someone, it's a man who cannot marry her? Or is it that Homer is a philanderer who breaks her heart? Is it that the patriarchal system of the Old South punishes a woman for being independent, assertive, and generally unladylike? Remember, she intimidates men and refuses to acknowledge authority of any sort. Is it that she feels the need to kill someone in order to prevent being abandoned and alone again? As I said earlier, one reason she likely turns to Homer is because he is a stranger to the community. He's not caught up in this cycle of abuse and gossip that they subject Emily to. Is the tragedy that she could sleep with Homer's corpse for 40 years? Is it that the town projects onto Miss Emily their own judgments and arrogant ideas only to turn around and condemn her for them? For instance, they say that there's an arrogance in Miss Emily, a feeling that she is above others, but you should take note that they are the ones who have a problem with her relationship with Homer. They don't like him because they believe as a Yankee and a day laborer, he is not good enough for her. She clearly has no qualms about this man. It's someone to share companionship and love with. Or maybe the tragedy has less to do with Emily and more to do with a town that not only doesn't intervene in a positive way, but interferes simply to satisfy its own needs, interests, and curiosities. Here's the real kicker, in my opinion, the greatest tragedy of all. Even in death, Miss Emily continues to be invaded and violated with the perpetuation of these past invasions as a sensational narrative that is shared with us, who now equally curious of this strange, bloated, old, intimidating, pallid woman gobble it up and feel the curiosity, horror, ambivalence, and strangeness of it all. In fact, the narrator presents a story that is so heavily manipulated in its organization and time that he renders us complicit in the objectification and exploitation of Miss Emily. Think about this. What does he know from the very beginning? Everything. He knows why she bought the poison and why Homer was no longer seen around town. He knows that Emily is a murderer and that she was giving China painting lessons to children while a dead man sat upstairs rotting away, and that she was lying with and quite possibly sleeping with this dead man for decades. He knows, but he withholds it from us. And he manipulates the story's chronology, telling it in a way that suits his version of events. And I want to quote Ruth Sullivan here because she has managed to articulate so concisely the order of events as they are presented in the story. She says, The story begins at the end of Miss Emily's life. It then goes backward to 1894 and sometime after her father's death when Colonel Sartorus has her taxes remitted, then forward from there to the next generation that demands those taxes, then backward to the smell incident 30 years earlier. Now, the narrator's recording of that incident, of the one following it concerning the death of Emily's father and of her courtship by Homer Barron, twists chronology almost beyond recognition. First, the smell episode precedes the other two in the narrative, but in terms of Miss Emily's biography, it postdates her father's death and her courtship. Second and more remarkable is the way the narrator shifts from past to present to past during each episode. For instance, in the smell episode, the narrator places the time as 30 years before the failure of the earlier tax collecting board of aldermen, two years after Emily's father's death and a short time after Homer deserted her. Now, all this tells us then that the narrator and the community at large has a personal, emotional, and psychological interest in Emily, which should render him unreliable and questionable to us as readers. Specifically, think about how he makes us feel like there were logical explanations for some of Miss Emily's actions. You'll notice that when she buys the poison, the narrator makes us believe that it is so she may commit suicide. Or when Homer is no longer seen out and about, we remember that earlier the narrator had said, well, that was two years after her father's death and a short time after her sweetheart, the one we believed would marry her, had deserted her. After her father's death, she went out very little. After her sweetheart went away, people hardly saw her at all. 
In other words, the narrator is engaged in a sensational story and he forces us to walk step by step through the community's very voyeuristic, invasive, and judgmental journey of Miss Emily Grierson. And the deeper we delve into the story, the more creeped out and curious we become of her. So much so that we suddenly find ourselves part of this community who has abused and exploited Miss Emily her entire life. In other words, we are not privy to Emily's authentic experiences, and so we're not asked to sympathize with or understand her. So we should consider how we are misled into not clearly seeing Miss Emily as a perpetrator, but also as a victim. All in all, the narrator has created a grotesque, isolated woman who looks more dead than alive, who lives in a gothic, decrepit home of old, and who can only be seen momentarily in her window. He wants us to get the shivers and leave the story with those images of that long strand of iron gray hair on the pillow and Homer's dead corpse with his arms out in an embrace. Throughout this story, the narrator creates an air of mystery around Miss Emily, even though he gives us enough information to understand the source of her madness, isolation, and crime. It's up to us to read between the lines and see that Emily Grierson, you know, is is more than what this narrator would like for us to believe. Please share with me in the comments below your thoughts on this story, Miss Emily, the narrator, and your role as the reader of this story. And be sure to check out some of my other lectures on a variety of classic literature, writing, and rhetoric. Thanks so much for joining me today, and I hope to see you guys in the next one.